There are uh, several different reasons that John states uh, why he was writing the letter. We've already uh, got to two of them. Uh, One's in chapter 1. These things we write to you that your joy may be full. That's chapter 1, verse 4. Another one's in chapter 2, verse 1. My little children, these things we write to you so that you may not sin. So if you want to have fullness of joy, then um, you're going to want to not be walking in sin. Uh, Those things are going to... um, be mutually exclusive. Then uh, our verses tonight uh, will uh, catch another one. It's verse 26 of chapter 2. These things I've written to you concerning those who try to deceive you. This is another issue. Um, So uh, later on he'll say in chapter 5, we've written these things to you so that you would know that you have eternal life. Verse 18 is where we'll start. Little children, it's the last hour. And as you've heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come, by which we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us, but they went out that they might be made manifest that none of them were of us. But you have an anointing from the Holy One, and you know all things. I've not written to you because you do not know the truth, but because you know it, and that no lie is of the truth. Who is a liar, but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? He is Antichrist, who denies the Father and the Son. Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father either. He who acknowledges the Son has the Father also. Therefore, let that abide in you which you heard from the beginning. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, you also will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he has promised us, eternal life. These things I've written to you concerning those who try to deceive you. But the anointing which you have received from him abides in you, and you do not need that anyone teach you. But as the same anointing teaches you concerning all things, and is true and is not a lie, just as it has taught you, you abide in him. Lord, we thank you for the simplicity of your word. We thank you for the unity of your word that you say the same thing essentially everywhere in the Bible, that we need you and that you're the only one and we can have a relationship with you through your son. And whether it's in the old covenant pointing towards Jesus or now reading in the New Testament, uh, looking at the realities that have now made, been made possible uh, by your death and resurrection. And really, it's as simple as abiding. And so we pray that you'd help us to understand Lord, we're living in these last days, this last hour that John is talking about when there are many Antichrists and the Antichrist is coming, and there are those that would lead us astray. We thank you, Lord, that you've given us um, the answer so that we can have fullness of joy, so that we can have the assurance of, of eternal life and have that hope of eternal life, have fellowship with you, to not have sin ruling over us, that you've given us these things. So encourage us again as we continue on studying this letter that John wrote to the early believers. May it speak to us again tonight, Lord, fresh and in a new way. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So the verses that we are going to cover tonight, they begin with a a big word, the word Antichrist. Um, Before we look at that, though, as we read through the whole section, you'll notice in verse 24, there's a therefore. Uh, The key verses in this section are verses 24 and 25. That's the nugget of truth. That's the part that he's emphasizing. Um, Verse 24, he says, Let that abide in you which you heard from the beginning. There it is. That's what he's getting at. Let that abide in you which you've heard from the beginning. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, you will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he's promised us eternal life. That's the core truth that he's emphasizing. Now, because that's what he wants for us, for his readers, and we're his readers, reading much later, but uh, what he wants for those that would read his letter is that they would know that they have eternal life, they'd be able to have fellowship with the Father and with the Son, that they'd be abiding in the Father and the Son, enjoying that fellowship and having that eternal life. Now, because that's his goal, that's that nugget of truth, there's then something that he's concerned about because that's the therefore. So what, he, what leads up to that is this concern about those who would try to deceive them or deceive us. And so that's how he starts off with the teaching about those that would come with a false message. 
In verse 18, little children, it's the last hour. And as you've heard that the Antichrist is coming, have you heard that? Have you heard that the Antichrist is coming? He's coming. John said, have you heard that? You've heard that the Antichrist is coming. But then he says, even now, many Antichrists have come, by which we know it's the last hour. It's interesting that in the context, he's talking about eternal life. He mentions the one who does the will of God abides forever in the previous verse, verse 17. Who you does the will of God abides forever. And then he says, after talking about forever, he said it's the last hour. An hour and forever, those are very different concepts. One is a measurement, an increment, something that, that can be placed in a specific time in history. And the forever is the forever of God, entering into that age-abiding life. God is without beginning and without end. Now, we're with a beginning, but we're without end. The Bible talks about how we will live forever. We'll either live forever in the presence of God and in God's glory and in and, and His peace and in his love and, and rejoice in all of that, or we'll be separated from him forever. But we are going to live forever. We didn't live forever before. We began at a certain point and now we'll live forever. But God's forever in both directions. He always is, always has been, always will be. He's forever. So in, as it relates to human history, though, things happen in increments of time. The forever is affected by the increments of time. So we're in the last hour. You're going to have eternal life. The one who does the will of God abides forever, but we're in the last hour. And the Antichrist is coming. This word Antichrist is a word that is used pretty commonly. I think uh, there's there's been a lot of really good teaching about the end times. There's been some weird teaching about the end times, but we're really blessed, I think. There's a lot of really good teaching about the end times, very biblical teaching about the end times. And so the idea of an Antichrist is not something that... uh, our whole culture isn't aware of at least the word. And John's the one who uses it. Um, Paul refers to this person as the man of sin, the son of perdition. He doesn't call him Antichrist. John's the one who uses the term Antichrist. And he speaks of a specific individual here. There are many others that will come, but there's really going to be this one who's sort of the ultimate. The word anti can be used in two different ways. One is against and the other is in the place of, as an adversary or as a replacement. So when you think of Antichrist, you can think of it in those two ways. The, he, this is a person that's against Christ, but I think the way that the Bible talks about this person, the influence that they'll have and the place that they'll have in the world is, yes, they're an adversary of Christ and they're against Christ, but the way they will appear in the last hour, as it will be in the place of Christ. Let me tell you right now, the world that we live in is looking for a Messiah. They're just not looking for Jesus. The world that we live in is looking for someone who will come and deliver them from their fears. We have so many fears about the ecology, uh, about the nature of things, uh, the condition of the world. Um, We're experiencing the worst drought in recorded California history, which is a whopping 150 years. But in the last 150 years, we've never had a drought quite like the one we've had. They went to measure the snowpack, I think on, was it May 1st or something? And, and there was no snow to measure. So it was the first time they'd never had that before. And, and since they've been measuring the snowpack. So, you know, people are looking at the world and they're thinking, you know, whoa. Well, the Bible says in the last days, it won't be the sign of the end, but you'll see things increasing of earthquakes and famines and and wars, and all these different things. And we look at the world that we live in, and you see the whole Middle East upside down, inside out. But we've had plenty of wars. We've had a couple of world wars. We've had genocides, not just in one place, but in many places. You might might call what's happening in in parts of Iraq as sort of a genocide right now. And there's just terrible things happening. The world just so chaotic. And, And the world's looking for a Messiah. So the Antichrist is someone that's an adversary of Christ or against Christ, but he also, the word anti, means in the place of. There's going to be a person that will rise up and they will be considered by the world as the Christ, the Messiah, the Savior. The world's looking for that person. They want somebody to save them. They're not looking for the cross. They're not looking for someone who would come and and, and die on the cross for their sins. They're not looking for someone who come and say, you must lose your life if you're going to find it. They're not looking for someone who will say, deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. They're not looking for that person. 
But if someone will come in and take Jesus' place, push Jesus out of the way as an adversary, but in order to take his place and say, I'm the Savior, the world's looking for that. They want it. And there's plenty of, of need for deliverance in, in so many ways. And so this person's coming. The Bible warns us about him. He's talked about in the Old Testament. Daniel says very specifically when he lays out the kingdoms of the world that there will be a final world leader that will come out of what's left of the Roman Empire. Daniel tells us there will be four major world kingdoms, the Babylonians, then the Persians, then the Greeks, then the Romans. And out of the Romans will come a federation of ten. And then out of those ten, three of them will be ripped out and one will take his place and he'll make himself as a king. And he'll make himself so that he fights against Israel and he fights against the people of God. And he'll go into the temple, it says, and make it desolate, make an abomination of desolation. Paul writes about this person, calling him the man of sin in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and chapter 2. He talks about this person coming and how he'll come with the power of Satan and how he'll deceive people, how he's going to be revealed, that he'll take his place in the temple proclaiming that he's God. So this Antichrist is coming. John's not talking so much about end times prophecy right here. He's not talking about the, the identity of the Antichrist or the place of the Antichrist in terms of you know, the rapture of the church or these kind of things. But he does say the Antichrist is coming. The Antichrist is coming. And many Antichrists have already come. We've had so many that have come and have created religions that would take people away from Jesus. And so many of them, they want to keep Jesus in their pantheon of gods. They want to sort of say, well, Jesus is a good teacher. Well, what part of his teaching did you like? Are you just going to pick some or the other? Like, what about what he said? Unless you believe that I am, you will die in your sins. You believe that part? <laughs> or what about when he said, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. Or when he said, I'm the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. But the Muslim faith, the, those that follow Islam and, and believe in the prophet Muhammad, they want to believe in Jesus. They want to say, well, Jesus was a good teacher. He was a prophet. He was a good man. And, and yes, we respect him, and he's right up in there somewhere. Not at the top, but he's, he's good, and we don't want to be against Jesus. We have uh, the cults that originated in the United States that have impacted uh, the world. The Jehovah's Witnesses, they've got a version of Jesus that that he was Michael the archangel in the Old Testament, and then he was made into Jesus, and then after he died, then he was remade back into the angel of the Lord. He's Michael. Well, that's not that Jesus, that's not the Messiah in the Bible. That's not what the Bible says, but that's what they believe. They've done something to Jesus. They've made him not who he said he is. We have the Mormon um, religion and, and the, uh, the Church of the Latter-day Saints and the revelation that, that Joseph Smith claims that he got that is accurate, it's from God, but it's a whole different kind of Jesus. That there was once this God, Elohim, who was the father of, of his own children and his own planet, and, and there was sin on the planet, there was, there was a, a council that was brought together, and then his sons, who, in, who included Lucifer and Jesus, and they were spirit sons that he had by having relations with a woman in heaven, and she birthed these sons. I mean, you think, like, where in the world is that in the Bible? It's not in the Bible. It couldn't be further from the truth of what the Word of God says. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever? The one who in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God? The same was in the beginning with God? All things came into being by Him. Apart from Him, nothing came into being that has come into being. The one who said, before Abraham was, I am. Jesus' identity is very clear in the Scripture, but there are many different groups that have come. They're not the Antichrist. He's coming, John says, but there are many Antichrists. But not just those cults that we think of or those false religious systems, but anything that would come along that would take Jesus' place in our lives. Any lie, any deception, because that's the point that he makes. Now, it's interesting here in verse 19, where do these antichrists come from that he's talking about? He says, they went out from us. It's interesting. Uh, the source of so much of this false teaching is actually the church. 
well, it's not the church, it's someone that was in the church at one point, and then they left the church and because of all this crazy, weird, you know, thing they wanted to do. And, and we've had many things like that. They went out from us, but they were not of us. They were, they were in our midst, but they weren't really saved. And the Bible tells us that. Jesus made it really clear when he gave the parables about the kingdom that there would be a mixture within the kingdom of God. He said the kingdom of God's like a net that a man throws in the sea, and when he pulls it in, there's all kinds of stuff in the net. <laughs> some of it's good, and you keep it, and some of it, you chuck it. That's not really a great analogy when you think of the kingdom of God. You think, well, that's like saying, hey, your church is awesome. It's like a net. You throw in the sea, and you just get a bunch of stuff. Some, keep, some are keepers. You think, no, all of us are keepers. <laughs> we all, right? We all get to be keepers. Well, Jesus warned and said there will be some that will be in the midst. They're not. They're not of us. That's what John says here. Jesus told the parable of the terrors, the, the, uh, the weeds. A man, He said a man went out and planted in his field, and the servants planted, and they filled the field, and then the, the grain started to grow, and they could see that there were the tares, the weeds that were growing with the true wheat. They looked the same growing up. And you can't tell until it's time to bear fruit, and they, the weeds never bear fruit. So the servant said, you want us to go out there and rip them all out? And, and the master said, no, you might you might destroy some of the wheat. So just leave them, and at the harvest time, they'll get sorted out. So what we would expect then within the fellowship is that, well, that's going to be the case. And even here, they went out from us. That's disturbing, isn't it? But that's the truth. They went out from us, but they were not of us. They would have continued with us, he says in verse 19, if they had been with us, but they went out that it might be made manifest that none of them were of us. It's interesting that all of these groups, they want to be considered Christians. Uh, the, the Mormons want to be considered a denomination of Christianity. They try to refer to themselves as that. But there is no evangelical church that would ever accept the Mormon doctrine of who Jesus is. Now, the evangelical church, the church that believes in the gospel of Jesus Christ, is very diverse. And its expressions of worship are very diverse. So diverse that we cannot meet in the same place, and get along. That's just a reality. Some person's very emotional, and their style's a certain way, and the other's other people are so conservative. And there's just, on so many different ways, we, have, we are very, very diverse. But I tell you what, if Billy Graham comes to an area to preach the gospel, all the evangelical churches join, even if they're very, very different from each other. Why? Because we all believe in the same Jesus. We all believe that he died on the cross, that he rose from the dead, that he's the way of salvation. Now, they may fight to the death over how are you going to baptize somebody or whether you speak in tongues or all these other things. Um, and we shouldn't fight to the death over those things. They're not worth dying over. But when it comes to Jesus, the church knows what it believes. It's very united. And there isn't a, the church doesn't accept the Jehovah's Witness view of things. The church doesn't accept the Mormon view of things any more than it accepts the, the Muslim view of things. It's a different Jesus. It's not the Jesus of the Bible. They went out from us. They're not of us. If they had been of us, they would have remained with us. But they went out so that you would know that they're not of us. So that's something that's still happening. It was happening in the first century, and for 2,000 years it's been happening. Now, here's, here's something that he says is, I think, very important. And uh, it's one of my favorite passages in Scripture to teach as someone who's a teacher. Because... Verse 20, he says, you have an anointing from the Holy One, and you know all things. Jump down to verse 27. The anointing which you've received from him abides in you, and you don't need anyone to teach you. So I'm fired. And the same anointing teaches you concerning all things, and it is true. It's not a lie just as it is taught you. You will abide in him. You see, God's provided for us. Someone who lives inside of us who lets us know what's true. You have that. You've had that happen. You had that happen when you were a brand new Christian. You didn't know anything in the Bible. You've known something was wrong, and someone said, well, how can you say that? And you go, I don't even know. I don't know the chapter and verse. I just know. Well, how do you know? Well, you have an anointing from the Holy One. Here's an interesting thing. What does the word Christ mean? It means anointed one. Who are we talking about here who's coming to deceive the Antichrist, in the place of Christ. And John's saying, but you have an anointing. Now, he's not talking about um, 
some superpower that you have that other people don't have. He's, he's describing your relationship with Jesus. When you become a Christian, what happens to you? You're born again. What does that mean to be born again? It means you're born of the Spirit. What does it mean to be born of the Spirit? It meant, means to be made spiritually alive. How does that happen? It happens by the power of the Spirit. The Spirit of God comes to live inside of us, and our hearts become Christ's home. So who's living inside of me but the anointed one? <laughs> I have the Spirit of Christ living within me. I, I have the Spirit of Jesus, the Holy Spirit, His Spirit in me. And so I have an anointing from the Holy One. So if someone's in the place of the anointed one, I've got the anointed one living inside of me. I can spot a counterfeit. Do you understand what he's saying? So, so yes, it's important to teach people about the cults. Yes, it's important to be able to give a defense for what you believe. Yes, it's helpful to try to give people answers when they have good and honest questions. I don't ever really think it's helpful to argue with somebody. Uh, at least it's never been uh, effective, anybody I've ever argued with. They just have gotten mad. Um, and I was mad. You know, It really wasn't very helpful. Um, they left, but, but that was probably the only helpful thing. Um, <laughs> arguing's not going to change something for somebody. Now, we do want to know that we do want to be able to give answers if someone has an honest question. Well, why do you believe this about the Bible? Or why do you think Jesus is that? Why, you know, can you show me in the scriptures why you believe what you believe? Well, that's good. I'm not saying that we shouldn't do that, but John's not talking about that. He's talking about, remember the key verses I said were verses 24 and 25. He's talking about abiding in the Father and in the Son and knowing that you have eternal life. That's the key. Now, how, are you, how do you, you, you abide in Jesus? By letting his words abide in you. Jesus said, abide in me, and I'll abide in you. Like the branch and the vine are abiding together, you'll be able to bear fruit. He said, if you abide in me and my words abide in you. If we're walking in that fellowship with God, then there's that presence of God with us, this exchange, this life that we experience that we have from God. So then if someone comes with some false message and you have this relationship with the Lord... You may not be able to turn to the verse, and sometimes it's humbling because maybe the person at your door has all their whole thing memorized, and they're ready to just work you with proof text after proof text, and you're sitting there going, dude, I don't know, but I know you're wrong. <laughs> How do you know I'm wrong? Because I have Jesus living inside of me, and I'm telling you right now, my red siren is going off, and I'm at DEFCON 5. Woo, woo, woo. Like some, I just know. What you just said is not true. I know it's not true. How do you know it's not true? I just know it is. I know it's not. I know that you're, you're not telling me the truth about who Jesus is. Why? Jesus is the Christ, and I've got an anointing. I've got the Christ. I've got the Holy One. I've, God's given me His Spirit. What an awesome thing that we have that. You have an anointing from the Holy One, and so you know all things. Now, don't use this to tell people that you know everything. John's not saying, okay, look, you got saved, now you know everything. You, you know, don't quote this, if, especially teenagers. Uh, don't quote this to your parents. Hey, the Bible says I know everything. Well, you know everything that's important. You know how to get to heaven. You know that you're going to heaven. It's pretty much all you need to know. So maybe you do know everything. You know all things. I have not written to you, he says in verse 21, because you, you don't know the truth but because you know it, and that no lie is of the truth. Now here's what he's talking about, the definition. Verse 22, who is the liar but the one who denies that Jesus is the Christ? That's the Antichrist, who denies the Father and the Son. Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father either. He who acknowledges the Son has the Father also. So John is telling us that the test is Jesus. So if a person says, look, we got a relationship with God, Yes, we have a different Jesus than you, but we all believe in the same God. And our Jesus is different than your Jesus, but we have the same God as you. Is that true, according to John? The answer is no, it's not true. If someone says, I believe in uh, Allah, and He is God, and I was raised in this part of the world, and this is my experience, and this is who I think He is, and, and you believe in Jesus because you're raised in this part of the world, and you believe in God, it's all the same God, and, and we just have a different Jesus, but we all believe in the same God. John says, if you don't believe in the Son, that He is the Christ, that He is 
what the word Christ means. He's the fulfillment of this Old Testament scriptures, the promised one, the only begotten Son of God who died on the cross and rose from the dead. Then that's the Antichrist. That's the person that's in, in opposition to Christ and in the place of Christ. So we're living in a day and age where there's so much pressure to, be, and especially because of so much drama that's in the world because of religious wars. And so there's just a pressure, especially for unbelievers, to just say, look, stop. Don't you guys all just believe in the same God anyways? Like, no, we don't. That doesn't mean we should go and have a war over it. But no, we don't believe in the same God. No, we don't. Well, how are you to, who are you to say that? That's not narrow-minded. Well, listen, Jesus is the test. What do you say about Jesus? Is he God's son? God's only begotten son? The unique son of God who died on the cross for our sins and rose from the dead on, on the third day? Who's the, the sacrifice for our sins? Now, we don't expect people to be able to clearly articulate or, or, or give a, a detailed explanation of what the Trinity is or means, but do you believe that Jesus is God come in the flesh, the only begotten Son of God? You have to. That's who He is. And if you have a different Jesus, th then you don't have a relationship with the Father, John says. That's a deception. That's being led astray. Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father either, John says. So there it is. Can't be more clear in the Scripture. If you acknowledge the Son, you have the Father also. That's awesome. <laughs> I do know I have a relationship with God. How do you know? Because I've confessed His Son, Jesus Christ, is my Lord. He died for my sins. I've accepted Him as my Lord and Savior. I've given Him my life. I'm trusting in Him. I have the assurance that the one true God is my Father, and I have a relationship with Him because I know His Son. And if I reject His Son, I can be just as sure that I don't have a relationship with Him. So, this encouragement then, the therefore, in verse 24, therefore let that abide in you, which you heard from the beginning. That's what he really wants to get at. Let these things abide in you. What things? The things you heard from the beginning. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, you will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he's promised us, eternal life. Remember, John's writing these things so that we'll have fullness of joy. One of the things that will produce joy in your life continually is knowing that you're saved. Listen, you can have a bad day, you can have the worst day, and you can stop and sit at the end of a really bad day and think, if I died right now, I'm going to heaven. Lord, could I die right now? <laughs> You've thought that. You've thought, Lord, this is a terrible day, this is a terrible situation, and this situation is not going to get better, it's probably going to get worse. But then, at the bottom line of whatever happens, you're saved. You have eternal life. I'm not hoping for eternal life. Like one day I'll die and this miserable thing will be over and then I'll get my eternal life. I have it. I'm alive right now. I'm alive from the dead. I'm saved from my sins. I have eternal life. Uh, the Old Testament in the Psalms, there's the phrase repeated, the joy of your salvation. The joy of your salvation. To know that you're saved. Now, um, you know, we as a culture, we love sports, and uh, we have sports that last year-round, and it's a variety. You, we have sports that are uh, played indoors and outdoors with different types of, um, there's, there's weird-shaped, pointy, oblong ball things, and then we have round ones, and we have little ones. We play them with sticks. Uh, we have guys that run around with a ball and a net and a stick. We play games on, on ice, there's games for the winter, um, we have races, we have wrestling, we have beat each other to death games, almost to death. Um, you can pretty much do almost anything to the person. Uh, and so we have all of these contests. And you'll see a person when they've triumphed in that arena, and we just know it, we see the person, they've won the match. And you see them just running like... I, I, the Women's World Cup is right now, and I just love why, soccer to me is so funny because I think they don't get very many goals, and so they go insane when they make a goal. And I just don't totally understand the celebration of just running. Like you play soccer, you're running the whole time. Like, so they, I made a goal, and then it's like, they're just running. I, they just run like a lunatic. It's just so weird. Um, but that's what they do. I get the football one where you spike the ball. It seems kind of like running there. I ah, throw it down. And, 
Um, but you know, some of the football players, they've kind of had to stop them because they would organize and choreograph dances. <laughs> you get a penalty now if it looks like you had a choreographer. That's true. I'm not, am I making that up? No, you get a 15-yard penalty if it looks like you had a choreographer. So if you bust out a move and you do your little salsa thing or whatever when you get your touchdown, but if you guys all come out and go, na, 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 you know, do your thing, fifth, they're going to throw the flag. So we have all this, and it's a joy on a certain level, right? Well, why are those guys doing that? Look at them. Why are they doing that? Well, their team just um, won. Or they win the championship. They won. They, they're the best team for that year in their sport. Or the gold medal or something. There's just this, it's like an ultimate sort of a once in a lifetime experience. And you see all this celebration and all this joy. But you know, in a few hours, the parties move to somewhere else. Someone's in there cleaning up all the mess and the locker room goes back to normal. It's not very long that it lasts. But there's a real exuberance, a real joy. But man, if you just, I just think of it, it's, it's just so hollow and it's so brief. It's so transient. And we have the joy of our salvation. You know what, you guys? We won. It's over. The only thing that matters, we already won. It's done. You gave your life to Jesus Christ, you won. You will never lose again. It's not like, oh, I won for this season, but I'll wait till the next lifetime. I hope I get saved when I get reincarnated. No, 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 no. This is it. It's appointed unto man once to die and then the judgment. You gave your life to Jesus. You're saved. There's a new body in heaven. We've had people that we love that have gone before us. Guess what? They're there. We're going to go see them. You're going to get there. You go, look, you got hair. It's looking at Mike. Sorry. <laughs> you know, like you just look and you go, I mean, I don't know. How, we'll, we'll, we'll know each other. It won't be earth. It won't be earth on this massive scale. It's going to be heaven. Who we really are, saved, washed, cleansed, no more flesh. We have that right now, you guys. That victory is ours in actual possession. So John's saying, I'm writing these things to you so that you will have the fullness of joy. The fullness of joy comes in having fellowship with God, abiding in the Father and in the Son. There will be those that will come. They might even come from within us. They'll go out from us because they're not really with us. They might come and they'll come and give some kind of doctrine that it will take us away from Jesus. Don't ever believe in anything that will take you away from Jesus. Don't ever believe in anything that will take you away from Jesus because he's our savior. He says in verse 26, I'm writing these things to you, or I have written them, concerning those who are trying to deceive you. That's interesting. The word uh, translated as deceive has the idea of wandering or being lost or being led astray as, as so you lost the path. See, there are certain people that would come and they would mess with your GPS, so to speak. They would come in and you're trying to follow the directions and you're looking at, the th how do I do this? And they're turning your map upside down. They go, no, no, or they'll mess with your compass. They'll lead you astray. They'll get you off the path. This is a reality. But... Verse 27, the anointing that you've received from him abides in you. The anointing that you've received from him abides in you. And you don't need anyone to teach you. If someone comes along and acts like because they're super smart or they're learned or they know the original language or they've done all these studies or they earned a PhD or whatever it is and they present themselves as being so far above me or you, that we can't possibly know what they would know and that we just have to trust them and they're going to lead us on the way and they're, the anointing that you have that's inside of you is saying, that's bogus. Then the person's bogus, okay? Even if they got a degree from a university that everybody would know, even if they've got a PhD or a master's of divinity or they've got some kind of a thing or they've got this many years of doing this kind of you know, archaeological study, or they're an expert in Semitic languages, and they'll say these things. It's bogus. The anointing that you've received from him will teach you. What does that mean? It means Jesus is living inside of you. And he'll say, bogus. That's false. I, um, I'm very thankful for the day that we live in with a computer and the ability uh, to access uh, such an amazing library uh, the, the Bible study computers today are just, uh, the programs are just amazing. 
And so you have access to all of this information. And, and so um, I, I try to read a lot of it and um, try to see where people are coming from or what they're saying about different background or words or history or the context or whatever study they've done on a certain passage. But it's interesting to me that uh, I'm, I don't have an advanced degree in this stuff. I have a college degree in it, but not an advanced degree. But uh, my bogus meter works really good. <laughs> the anointing that I've received from him teaches me all things. And you can read, the, and these guys are so smart. You know, they'll, 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 they'll say, I was reading a guy to these guys, this famous set commenter. It's a dictionary set. It's the definitive one. It's huge. It used to be that you used to put it on your shelf as like a big trophy. It's like this big. It's like 12 volumes. It's huge. It takes up a whole shelf, these big fat volumes. And uh, I was reading these guys today. This one guy said, like so and so said, and then it's like half a page in Latin. I think, well, thanks. <laughs> I was looking for, uh, you know, the explanation. Amscre, Ach outway, you know. Pig Latin. I didn't understand a word of it. And then they send this other stuff, and then, and then they just said a bunch of bogus stuff. Well, do I look at that and say, well, these guys are super smart, and they've got these degrees, and so it must be right. No. That's what John's saying. No. What does the Bible say? If you're, if you're listening to somebody talk, and that includes me, if you're listening to somebody talk, and they say something, you think, I'm not sure that's right. And the Bible verse pops into your head, that's the Holy Spirit. That's the Holy Spirit helping you. You have an anointing. That word anointing, that's the, that's the same root. It's not the, exact, it's not the word Christ. It's the same root that the word Christ is from. It, and I think it's the word chrisma. The idea, it's the idea of anointed. It's, it's the idea of something being poured out. That's what the word Christ means. The Christ or the Antichrist, the one in the place of Christ, but you've got an anointing. The anointed one has given you an anointing. Well, what's the anointing from the anointed one? It's himself inside of you. So I want to encourage you, don't, um, if you turn on the, I mean, we're out of the holiday season, but if you turn on the television during Christmas or Easter, you can almost always find on some Discovery Channel or you look at the news magazines, or, you know, the historical Jesus. And they'll, they say the same thing every year. Paul did this, and Jesus was really this, and the apostles changed that. And they'll quote some person, they'll say, he's a PhD at, and it'll be some amazing school like Yale or Harvard or you know, some famous religious school or whatever, and that person will be saying these things. Listen, let me just tell you what John said. You don't need that guy to teach you that Jesus isn't who the Bible says he is. <laughs> yeah, does that make sense? That's what John's saying. You believe in who Jesus is, what you received from the beginning. How did you get saved? I believed in Jesus. What did you believe? I believe he died and rose from the dead. Well, you didn't know everything about him. Well, of course I didn't know everything about him. But I knew, I knew what I knew about him, and that was he was God's son, and he died for me, and he rose from the dead. Don't let anybody ever tell you something different, no matter how many degrees they have or how smart they appear. Usually they don't appear smart. They, <laughs> these guys are... I get so mad at those guys. You don't need anyone to teach you, but the, as the same anointing teaches you concerning all things, it's true, it's, and it's not a light. What does it teach you? Look at the last phrase. We'll end with this. Just as it is taught you, abide in him. You want to know how that anointing's from the Lord? It's telling you, abide in Jesus. So if you've got something inside of you saying, you don't need to abide in Jesus, you can go your own way. That's not the Lord. <laughs> The anointing that you've received from him is going to say Jesus is who he is and you should abide in him. Isn't it, isn't it amazing how simple our Christianity is? Our Christianity is all summed up in that simple phrase, abide in Jesus. And what does the word abide mean? Very simple. It means stay, remain. It doesn't have any connotation of any kind of work or effort. It just means stay. How do you get in Jesus? You believe in him by faith. You're saved by grace through faith. It's not of yourself. It's a gift of God. It's not the result of works that anyone should boast. How do you stay there? Well, you got in there by grace. You stay in there by grace. You just stay with Jesus. Stay with Jesus. Abide in Jesus. Listen to Jesus. 
And if we think of this letter as being written so that we will have fullness of joy, that we won't sin, that we'll have the assurance of our salvation, well, guess what? If you abide in Jesus, you're going to have, that's going to be working in your life. That's how we bear fruit. That's the joy of our salvation, that fellowship with God. That's the confidence of eternal life. So um, it's the last hour Antichrist is coming, but we've had many Antichrists, and John's concerned about people who would lead people astray. But he's, in some sense, he's not concerned. He's just giving them an encouragement because I, he says, I know that you have received an anointing and you know. So he's given us the permission to believe what we know is true in spite of whoever it is that's telling us something. Does that make sense? One of the things that, we, that uh, Gary Grace does every time he goes to Africa, at least every time I've been with him, we speak at the school, because Gary's older, uh, he's, he's very respected by the students, they just look up to him so much, and uh, one of the things that he does to the students, and it's, and it's uh, we, you know it's going to happen, and, and then he does it, and they fall for it every time, and he'll, uh, he'll have the whole class of students, and he'll start teaching them something, and they'll be telling the truth, and then he'll just veer off into something that's completely not true. I mean, just completely false. And uh, they just keep listening and taking notes. And he just keeps, ta- he just keeps talking about it. It's, it's not like a, false, like a legitimate false teaching, but it's just something clearly bogus, like it's just not true. And it, it doesn't do the same thing every time, so I can't give you an example. But just, you know, something that's obviously false. And, uh, and he'll go for 10 minutes. They're taking notes, they're listening, he'll say, does anybody have any questions? Anybody, you know, and then everyone's just listening, like, no, that's fine, that's great. And then then he drops the hammer on them and uh, says, well, listen, well, hey, and he could always start writing on the board and say, look at this, is this in the Bible? And then they're like, no, (laughs) but you're the leader. Culturally, for those guys in their village and where they're from, can you ever disagree with the leader? You can't. And what you do is uh, you be passive-aggressive. You shake your head like this in your heart. You're going, I'm never doing that, you lunatic. I mean, I know how those guys are. Some of my African brethren are laughing now. Um, but I think it's, it's very wise that he does that because at the end it becomes very powerful to them. He said, listen, you, because you love me and respect me, and I said something that's patently false and you because of your love and respect and I, I appreciate that and I love that about your culture but you have to understand that the Bible says what it says and you because someone's a leader or because they're American or because they're old or whatever the reason would be um, that's what John's doing here he's giving the Christians permission to violate maybe a cultural standard and say you might be the chief but if you're saying that about Jesus that's wrong you might be old. You might be older than my grandparents. But because this is what the Bible says about Jesus, that's what you're saying is not true. I'm not ever going to believe it. <laughs> and and, and there's, a, there's a lot of places in the world. We're a pretty maverick, individualistic con- country, um, so we're more prone to be cynical and not believe anything. But, th- but what he says is very powerful here. Um, don't believe it. Don't believe what someone says. You've got an anointing from the Holy One. You know who Jesus is. Stick with it. So Lord, help us. Help us, we pray. We thank you for the fellowship that ultimately you've done all these things so that we could have fullness of joy. And we know that that fullness of joy comes by being with you, by doing what you're doing and having the victory over this world. Everything that's going to burn up and pass away so, so, so weak that it won't last even 10 years, so many things that we think are so important. So many things that get invested in that won't even be around in 10 years, much less 100 years, much less eternity. And Lord, you've let our lives count for eternity, for heaven, a life that abides, and you've given us yourself. We have you living inside of us, this anointing that we've received from the anointed one the Holy Spirit inside of us to let us know who you are. And and so, Lord, give us victory. Help us to walk in holiness, to walk in the light. Help us to walk in fullness of joy and walk in the joy of our salvation, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.